I regret this morning I, I forgot to unmute un unpause my recording. Uh, I felt like oh, shit, that was a good one. That was okay, no, Len? It was interesting. How so was it interesting, Len? <laughs> Tell us. Uh, with uh, Rabbi uh, Salanter. Yep. I first of all I knew nothing about him. So that's that an it's an interesting background story about him himself. And um, I um, definitely fall into the category of um, less enthused by uh, Musser. And, um, but it definitely provided a perspective that I will have to uh, think about. Mm. Okay, let me get my seats. Hey guys. Hey Adrian. How are you, Brad? I miss you. I'm doing good. Thank you. I'm doing good. I miss you too. Erin. She's just getting there. She's you know, she's all right. Every say, day. Say hi. I will. Thank you. Thank you. I'm jumping internet services. So if I get disconnected, I'll come right back. You're all there, look at that. We survived the internet, that's amazing. Okay. Is he? I'm sorry, I'm trying to print this. Doesn't want to recognize me on my computer, on my printer. <laughs> okay, last chance. Doesn't mean if it's good or not. Okay. Did everyone watch Two Popes? Two Popes? Is that oh, a movie? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you guys watch the movie? Yeah. Two Popes? Adrian, yeah, did you watch? You did. Yes. And, and we have somebody else, too. <laughs> you have a stranger in your house, Avery? Yes. <laughs> uh -oh. Strangers is a mitzvah. <laughs> he looks married. Be careful. <laughs> um, you know what was fascinating, Hales? You know what was fascinating? I dare I say, I don't want to be critical of the Pope, but you know what was fascinating to me? is this, there was a scene there where they were both watching, I think they were watching the World Cup together. And one was rooting for Mexico and the other was rooting for Italy. 
um, I compared that to a greatest ages. I was like thinking of anyone in, so the Pope, the Popes are the top of the top of the top, right? I'm just thinking, could not, cannot come up with a single person that I would see as a, a seriously great individual, Talmud Fahim, that would care or at all be emotionally moved. A football, a, a football <laughs> game, a baseball game, or whatever it is. Rabbi, Rabbi Scheinberg, uh, when the Yankees won, like, what did the Yankees win in the 90s? World Series? The World Series, first time in a long time. Uh, always up there, but yeah, always up there. Yeah. So when Rabbi Scheinberg, uh, he he heard the he Rabbi Scheinberg was is was one of the great Torah sages. I, I spoke to him numerous times. He uh, when when the Yankees won the World Series, he grew up in America. He grew up in New York, and when the world the won the World Series, one of his students came in and and told him that the Yankees won the World Series. And he, he smiled and they asked him why he's smiling. He liked the Yankees. He said, it's the first time that I didn't feel any emotion that the Yankees won the World Series. <laughs> I know that I'm like so well, like it's, it's out of me. I'm like, so I'm grounded, I'm in, grounded in the yeah, Torah yeah. so much so. And he was in his 80s or 90s right. at the time where he'd spent a major part of his life. But um, it, it, it is a interesting concept. Um, so what we're going to do today is we want to discuss uh, a little bit about the halachas, the practical laws of entering into a church and evaluating um, what, what, what halachic challenges could come up with regards to entering into a church, entering into a sanctuary, a chapel, entering into a um, I don't know, a courtyard of a church, being around a, one of those pillars that they call of the saints. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, there are, I, I don't know if there are actions that people do in the church. Um, are, what, 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 what form, uh, what halakhic challenges do we face when, when we come across such a thing? Do you do the same thing for a mosque too? Do you, do you have the same, or is it totally different for a mosque? In a Good church? question. So what would you say? Mosque versus a church. Are they at all different? Yeah, I think not. Because a mosque doesn't really, yeah, you still have, they pray to a God, they don't have a prophet, or they have a prophet, but it's not like the intermediary like uh, the Christians have. So according to just, I don't think there's a single uh, halakhic posik that opposes, that holds that, um, that, uh, Islam is a practice of idol worship. I don't think there's anyone that feels that, and I think we all are in agree agreement from that perspective. Um, with regards to Catholicism, um, it, it definitely is, there's a lot of space to acknowledge that we're talking about a uh, possibility of, of, um, of what is our idol worship. So with regards to idol worship, what are the prohibitions with regards to idol worship? What, what prohibitions fall under idol worship? What are you not allowed to do <clears throat> with, uh, with regards to the service of an idol? Can't drink the, right? Can't drink the wine. Can't drink the wine, fantastic. Can drink, mm. cannot drink the wine. That's what we spoke about last week. It's called Yai Nesach, wine that was libated for an idol, prohibited. What else? Probably the same thing with the bread, the, the wafers they give, right? Because it represents something. The waiters, wafers, 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 yeah. wafers represent body. <clears throat> how right. about how about bowing down? Bowing down, bowing down to a cross, right? They bow, right? Then will they get on their knees? They get on their knees. That's right. That's right. In some, uh, it's a form of prayer, right? The way they pray is to get on the knees. In the pews they have, they have a, you, they have a thing that comes out, you, you, you kneel on it. Kneel on it. Okay, let's look at, let's, let's go to this, um, let's go to the source sheet. So there's, 
there's a the, the service of the god of the idol sorry service of the idol which we take for granted that that is for, forbidden prohibited not allowed to do the service and then the question comes up is what about all the other things what about things that are not considered service what about what about just entering into that area what about entering at different times so these are all issues that that come up uh, let's look at let's look at the sheets um touring the vatican and viewing its artwork is it permissible for a jewish tourists to visit the vatican a building that houses the roman catholic church um Um, generally, Jews are not permitted to enter a house of foreign worship. But what if a Jew wants to visit the Vatican for a purpose other than worship? Many tourists visit the Vatican in order to view the remarkable artwork that has been painted, gathered and collected there over the centuries. The Vatican archives also contain numerous Torah manuscripts, uh, such as the work of many of the Rishonim, and many scholars have been tempted over the ages to get a glimpse of uh, these rare and precious works. Some visitors to the Vatican have, been, have even reported seeing artifacts from the base of Mikdash stored there, including items as precious as the menorah and the parochis, the curtain that hung in front of the Holy of Holies. Uh, may Jewish tourists visit the Vatican in order to view these materials since the Jew has no intention to pay homage to the Christian faith. Okay, uh, questions that arise in regard to visiting the Vatican, three separate questions must be addressed. A, is it permissible, permissible to enter a house of idol worship? B, is it permitted to enter the areas immediately surrounding the house of worship? And assuming the halacha would permit entering the site of the Vatican, is there anything wrong with viewing the artwork displayed inside? Okay. So um, one thing I want to share with you is that um, <clears throat> in, in the time period between, uh, between uh, Pesach and Shavuot, that time period, 39, 49 days, is, uh, is a very difficult time in the Jewish nation. And there are numerous uh, occurrences that happened during that time period that we mourn about. One of them was, in, the, in France, a thousand copies of the Talmud, a thousand volumes of the Talmud had been burned publicly in, in France, in Xeris Tachvetat, their famous period in, in Jewish history. So um, think about over Europe, you had the Catholic uh, world controlled all of these major governments. And in fact, the king was really privy. He was, he was, he answered up to the bishop or the pope because that's where control came. So you did whatever they want. So ultimately the Christian world controlled so much. And therefore, um, when they destroyed so much, many of the manuscripts, I mean, we're talking about years before the actual printing press. So they're handwritten, many, many manuscripts, whatever was not burnt, a lot of it was confiscated, whatever was confiscated, was collected by the church and stored by the church. I am familiar that um, there was a, uh, I heard when I was growing up, I heard the story that there was a great sage who had a photographic memory. He got access to one of the archives at the Vatican and he found a book which had been out of print, which was completely out of print. The only copy was available was in, in the Vatican. And he read through, he paged through the entire book with his photographic memory left and he wrote, wrote it down. And that's those are one of the famous stories. Um, I think in my Rambam, he has, um, let me just pull it out. I think he has a um, quote from a Rambam that is archived at the Vatican. Let me just check.
so this is this is my volume. This is my Rambam. Um, I have a whole set of this Rambam, and he has in the back um, this person that put it together. His name is Frankel. <clears throat> Shabtai Frankel. It's a great individual who lived, who passed away 10 years ago. And um, he collected, um, he collected a whole bunch of archives of Maimonides of the Rambam. And, and he printed like an authentic copy of the Rambam. So what happened during the Rambam's time is he printed the Yad, uh, he, he printed this called the Yad Chazaka this 12 volume book on Jewish law. And then it was copied, handwritten numerous times. And then eventually it got into the printing press and got printed. So there are numerous copies from around the world that were being held by different people, different communities. And what he did, what Rabbi Frankel did, was he collected different archives or different manuscripts of the Ramam. Many of them, he's got Fuskatabiyad, a hand print, a hand hand copy. He, he's got numerous hand copies. Um, and uh, so here- he has one translated to English? Has this, this been translated to English? The Ramam's originally been translated. No, no, I mean this particular- So so what I'm saying is oh, like, so- Or oh, it's just hand print, okay. I in, in the back, so, so there's the original script of the Ramam, uh -huh. that's the original script. Right. And then in the back, He'll show you that halacha. There are different oh, words okay. that would would have been used, or this is the way he it is it is it is. I got you. Okay. These are the words that he used over mm -hmm. here. These are the way he used over here. So he's got. Um, um, so he's got hand hand copies. One is from Oxford. Taviad handwritten from Oxford. Um, got a whole bunch that were from Yemen, um, another one from the Oxford Library, another one from the Cambridge Library, another one from the Koifman Library in Budapest, um, the Spanish Library in Oxford, and the Angelica Library in Rome, number 63. These are all hand, hand uh, manuscripts. So it's just... Um, uh, very interesting. One of the amazing stories about um, Shabzai Frankel is that uh, he was working with a young scholar at his home uh, late at night, and uh, they're working over a manuscript. They're working over a manuscript, precious manuscript. And he asked the student, it was late at night, he asked him, uh, he's asking if he wants, if he would like a coffee. So he said, sure, he'll have, have a coffee. So Robert Frankel went into the kitchen, brought him a coffee, uh, coffee and the student wasn't watching. And he spoke and and like when he walked in, he put the copy down and he leaned over and the, and the copy spilled over the entire manuscript. And they all went to her, just can you imagine how this kid, how this guy felt? Hi, Shalom Aleichem, nice to see you. So, so he felt, can you imagine how bad this kid feels, right? A uh, young guy, whatever, They're drying it up. And the next thing that Rabbi Frankel did was he went back into the kitchen made another coffee and brought him another coffee. That was like yeah. the greatness of Robert Frankel. Um, okay. Phenomenal individual. Okay. Um, so let's let's learn a little bit. Here we have the Gemarion of Odizar. Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi Yonasan were once walking together when they came across a fork in the road. One of the paths, hi, shalom aleichem. One of the paths led past the house of idolatry and the other past a brothel. And how should we will go to visit prostitutes? So one said his friend, let us go past the house of idolatry since it's less enticing. Let's go past, let's go that way. And the other responded, let's go past the brothel and conquer our Yetzirah, our evil inclination, thereby receive extra reward. So then followed the latter one's advice and passed by the brothel. So what happened is the sages they um, uh, they criticized them. They said, "How dare you know what? You know, we should never put yourself in in danger of of such a situation." And they said, uh, "Because we were both studying together, we knew it was going, our study was going to 
um, was going to uh, defend us or was going to look after us. So what we clearly see is that there was, there was an option and um, what was wrong with walking past the, um, a place of idolatry? Nothing should have been too much of an issue, right? So uh, we're going to look at a toast first over here. From here, we see that it is appropriate to distance oneself from the house, from the opening of idol worship as much as possible. Mishum Dechsiv, as it says, Al Tikrav El Pesach Beta. Do not come close to the opening of her home. It's a verse in Mishle. Which is um, right, which is that's referring to don't go, don't go uh, um, in front of her house, meaning the house of idol worship. Okay, so here we take that from that Talmud, from that Gemara, we're going to turn it into Halacha. We're going to take it into Halacha, and that's going to be the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch says, mitzvah It is a mitzvah to distance oneself four cubits from a path leading to idolatry. So what is the, is there prohibition? Like as far as we sound like, it doesn't sound like it's a prohibition, but it seems like there is a mitzvah to avoid, right? Gemara, based on this prohibition against entering the house of idolatry on a pasuk in Mishle, does that make approaching the house of idolatry a doraisa, a biblical-based prohibition, or a derabanan, a rabbinically-based? Um, as the source of the Shulchan Aruch's ruling, the Vilna Gaon in Bera Agra cites the aforementioned Gemara's assumption that the verse, keep your path distant from it and do not approach the entrance of its house, is referring to the requirement to stay away from places of idolatry. Since the Gemara establishes this prohibition based on a verse of Mishle, it would appear that this prohibition should be accorded the status of Divrei Kabbalah, which is the laws of not directly rooted in the Chumash, right? We're not talking about worshiping, we're talking about walking past, okay? Uh, which are generally equated with Torah law, um, status of Divya Kabbalah, a law appearing in the Nevi Muqsivim, but not in the Chumash itself, which are generally equated with Torah law, which is the Torah with respect to the halachic application. Indeed, the Shevile David, David, writes the prohibition against entering a house of pagan worship constitutes a Torah prohibition. Okay. And consequently, several halachic authorities maintain that with respect to this halacha, one must act stringently in situations of uncertainty, as is the case of all biblically based laws. Okay, so now um, we're going to, what well, we first are drawing the conclusion is that we're considering that we have over here a, um, can we consider Catholicism as idol worship? That's the first question. And then what about the areas that are surrounding the outside of it? We understand that we shouldn't be walking four feet within that. I imagine what, what those um, original houses of worship were, was that there was no foyer. How do you say it? Foyer? Foyer. They didn't have like an entrance hole or whatever it was. It's like the door is open and you went straight in and there's the idol. Um, so the question is, um, what about the outside areas? Uh, question to consider, what about touring the area surrounding a church? Can you think of any reason why the halacha should be the same or different from touring a church? Um, to understand this issue, let's see the Shulchan Aruch's address to a similar question. Okay, so this is a, a common, uh, common uh, um, famous halacha, the uh, Jewish law that discusses how one needs to behave at the time of the festivals of idol worship, okay? Um, so a city that have a huge market 
on the day of their festival. And idol worships all come together into the city in honor of the idol. You're allowed to walk around when it passed by the city, but one is prohibited from going in to the city. However, um, if you're a citizen of that city or traveling as part of a caravan, then you're allowed to enter into the city. However, if one's traveling from city to city and there is one path that is clearly directed, If one's traveling from city to city and the, and the path is clearly the path that leads to the idol, to the place of idolatry, um, that's prohibited. What are we talking about? We're talking about someone who is visiting, but someone who lives in the city is allowed to walk around the city. Right. So the Ramah is the commentary of the Shulchan Aruch, and he says as follows. A courtyard of a place of idolatry. Now, just to remind us who was living where. Okay, just, just pause for a second. The Shulchan Aruch, it was written by? Cairo. Rabbi Yosef Cairo. Where did he live? He lived in... Born in Spain. Spain, yeah. He was born in Spain, but he was in what year? 1488. 1400. Oh, good. <laughs> 1488. So he didn't live in Spain for very long. He was four years old when they moved out of Israel, when they were kicked out. Um, and then he moved to uh, one of the islands. And then, no, he did not, he did not go to Europe. Um, he, he was living in one of the islands in that area. And then he made Aliyah to Eretz Israel. Um, so the Shulchan Aruch is writing as a citizen in the land of Israel, which is primarily controlled by Muslims, okay? The Ramah, 1520 to 1572, he's living, Rabbi Moshe Isidus, he's living in Germany, in Europe. Okay. So if I'm not mistaken, usually the Ashkenazi opinion is going to be more lenient with regards to their perspective on idol worship and, um, and Catholicism or the church in general. But I don't know. I haven't seen this piece yet. When they say the like the, uh, the, the what's it the Kutzer um, Kitzer Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch. Yeah. What did he just basically took Cairo and just uh, summarized, summarized it. it? Correct. That's what he did. So Rabbi Gansfried lived in the early 1900s, I believe. Right. Yeah. And uh, the Shulchan Aruch was written in 1560, around that time. So, so he kind of put it, he kind of made it put more it into modern, one into book. Mo it's into more the mo to his modern era. Of that. Well, he summarized it. Right. I mean, if you look at the Shulchan Aruch, it, it, it looks more, more than this, much more. We have like a small text on the top and many commentaries around the entire Shulchan Aruch. Um, one of the commentators is, um, is a whole bunch of commentaries. So, um, so Rabbi Gansfried is no commentaries at all. Just I'm just going to give you how the Lithuanian Jews practiced and should practice today. That's all it's like a short summary. Okay, so here's the Rama. The Rama in Europe, some people say that the courtyard of the house of idol worship has the same status as such as a city described in the Shulchan Aruch above, and hence it is permitted to enter such courtyards, so long as the courtyard is not actively being used for idol worship at the time. So he says, if you know the church times, prayer times, you're able to enter into the courtyard outside of those times. However, there are those who say that it is always forbidden to enter such a courtyard, since the path through the courtyard leads exclusively to the church. The minhag, the custom, is in accordance with the first opinion to permit walking in such a courtyard, but it is also praiseworthy to avoid such paths if there is an equally convenient alternative. Okay, so um, let's just take it from a practical perspective. My understanding in 
I, I don't know, I haven't been to the, to the Vatican, but I imagine that the, the active parts of the Vatican are, are usually off to tourists, closed off to tourists. Meaning, do you walk through a chapel in the order to see the Sistine, the Sistine chapel. chapel is the Sistine Chapel, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Okay, don't ask me about the Sistine Chapel. The Shulchan Aruch discusses the case of a city that hosts a special fair to celebrate, okay, we did this. Um, the Shulchan Aruch writes that in general, it's forbidden to enter the city on such occasion of the Shulchan Aruch. Um, does note, does note that a number of exceptions to this rule, such as permitting residents of the city to enter and allowing people traveling in caravans to pass through the city along their travel route, presumably because it is manifestly clear that such people are entering the city for personal innocuous reasons and not to give honor to any pagan deity. However, not everyone agrees that it is permissible to enter the courtyard of a church for personal reasons. The Ramah commenting on this ruling cites a dispute as to whether entering the, the courtyard of a church is always forbidden or only forbidden during periods of pagan celebration. It's clearly, however, it's clear, however, that according to both opinions, the Ramah, uh, in the Ramah, entering the house of worship itself is forbidden. Okay. So application to the Vatican. With regard to visiting the Vatican, it appears that entering areas used for services would certainly be forbidden whereas the permissibility of touring the area surrounding the church would be subject to depend on the two views cited the Ramah. One opinion would say that the area surrounding a church is always forbidden, and the other would say it's only forbidden during times of worship, meaning what we're both, uh, both opinions are trying to do is trying to establish what, can people see that you're clearly here as a tourist or not? Um, okay, so now the Tzitz Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg, he argued that the Ramah here seems to favor the stringent view, and hence Rabbi Waldenberg forbids, forbids touring the Vatican grounds, even when we were to avoid entering the actual Vatican itself. On the other hand, there are other authorities who adopt the lenient position cited in the Ramah and permit entering even the Vatican itself as part of a tour group. Such authorities feel that the prohibition against entering the house of worship stems from the appearance of participating, right? That's where, is, where, where the argument is. So when it's abundantly clear that one is entering for leisure or educational purpose, they, there are, they seem to say they will be permissible. However, it appears that the ma vast majority of halakhic authorities disagree with these latter authorities and forbid one to enter any church or Vatican areas that are actually used for worship under almost all circumstances. So there are few authorities that hold leniently that you can actually go into the chapel um, as long as it's during tour times and not during prayer times, but most most hold that it is forbidden. So would that be the same with what they're saying is like how the, the rabbis put a fence around it? Is, I, we say it it doesn't way, sound like it's, 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 it's But it's not really- It doesn't really sound a, like a fence. But it's not really a halakha, is it? It doesn't sound like it's a fence. It sounds like it is showing that you're giving some sort of respect to this deity. That's where it's, where okay. it's at, right? So we say that on the day of, uh, on a day of, um, on, a, on the day of the market, when, when everyone's on the day of this fair, when everyone's coming into the fair, into the city to, um, to pay respect, why can't you walk into the city? Right? Why can't you? The answer is, because since most people are walking into it to pay respect, that gives up the impression that you're also doing that, okay? Mm -hmm. However, if you're part of the city, if you're living in the city, so then it's clear that that is not part of your, your goal. Or if you're traveling through, clear that it's not part of your, your job. So it seems to be what, what the discussion over here is the discussion of whether what you're doing shows that you're giving more respect towards them or not. But, but it's, it's showing others, potentially. Yeah, if... if so, so maybe to Brad's point, it's, it's like going, I think, going into a non-kosher restaurant and buying a, a Diet Coke. 
which is the, the Coke is kosher, but you're giving the impression potentially to others that you're breaking the halakha of kashrut. You're, yeah. you're suggesting to others that you might be idol worshiping. Is that the halakha? So you bring up a very interesting question because um, I am familiar with numerous orthodox businessmen that will go to a meeting in a non kosher restaurant. And um, the challenge over there is that um, are, are you giving up the impression that you're eating non kosher, that a person who's an orthodox, seemingly orthodox Jew? Embarrassed to say this, but someone said that's why I wear my that's why I don't wear my tzitzis outside. You don't wear your tzitzis outside, so yeah. people don't think that. You... Well, I'm not sure with Shabbos, so they see me come out of a car around Shabbos, or they go, or I go into, even though I, I go into a non kosher restaurant, I don't eat, I don't eat meat, I don't eat, you know, I, I, I'm vegetarian there, but I don't want to give the people the impression that well, it's okay, he's a, so that's why. I want right, to, I want to. I wanna... I want to draw a distinction between a non-kosher restaurant and other things. I think it's a bit weaker than um, than a place of idol worship. I think idol worship is of yeah, the big yeah, three, yeah, yeah. and therefore um, it is so much more serious and significant that we are going to be very strict, very strict of of worrying about it. Mm -hmm. So far, we have focused on the issue of entering the Vatican and its surrounding areas. The next question that needs to be addressed is whether or not to the Vatican's artwork is permissible. What potential halakhic problems might arise with a Jew viewing artwork in the Vatican? Tell us, guys. What's the problems of view viewing art? Well, there are two. The Vatican Museum has arguably two different types of art. Uh, secular art as a vast collection, and then it would have art that is clearly depicting uh, idol worship. Okay. I think there's, there's more to add to that because regardless of whether or not it's a secular theme or a religious theme, Using the example that you said before, if you are projecting a sense of being spiritually moved, I think that would be enough to exclude that as, a, as an option for, for a practicing Jew. Yeah, but can't you, can't you just enjoy, I mean, there's people that just for the, the sake of the art, not for the, the sake of, of seeing Yoshki up there, but you know, we, we, it's, it's amazing, the, the artists and the, the pictures, the sculptures are, I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing how, how they are. And people who appreciate art, I think look at it as art, not, not a religion, not a, you know, not a something to, to pray to, but there are people that you do pray to. I think it's probably okay if you wear a badge that says you're there for the, for the non-religious reason. <laughs> I'm on Barry Cohen's tour. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I remember I was in France once in my life, and I, I, I allocated half an hour to go to the Louvre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> see them when they leave. <laughs> That was that was what I gave myself half an hour. Oh my gosh! You're lucky you worked on strike that day to see the Mona Lisa. That was in like 1994, and um, <clears throat> I stayed till they closed. I I think I got there at 10 a.m. and I think they the guard kicked me out. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's phenomenal, and I had zero education, basic high school education, which we hated our history teacher. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, I think Mona Lisa was the, the lowest part of the entire thing. I was just like, that was the biggest disappointment. Yes, of the it is. <laughs> uh, the, there are some pieces over there that are just, no. Okay, so here's a Gemara in Shabbos. 
with regards to seeing uh, different types of work of art, um, viewing a statue is forbidden since the verse says, do not turn toward foreign gods. The one I asked, how does this verse imply that looking at a statue, it says, do not turn towards other go gods, meaning do not pay your focus towards other gods. So the question is, how does this verse imply that looking at a statue is forbidden? Rav Hanina explained that the verse can be medically read, read as do not turn your focus towards that which you create with your own mind, i.e. a statue which is created through human creativity. Note the explanation of this last line is based on Rashi. Other commentators such as the Ritva translate the last line in a radically different manner. So what are they saying? Since it says, do not turn yourself... I just want to read the Hebrew because it kind of... Um, Okay, I'm going to read Hebrew and translate it. Okay, so the Gemara says, a person who's, who's walking under a statue um, is not allowed to read the inscription on Shabbos um, because it's secular work. Uh, it's something that one doesn't, it's not unique to Shabbos. But the Yukon Atma and the statue itself, even during the week, it's prohibited to look at because the verse says, do not turn towards the idols, towards, um, towards, uh, towards the uh, idol worship. Um, my Talmud, what is, how is it, how is one developing from this? Do not turn to that which is created with the imagination, which means do not turn even to things that are not the actual God, but are representatives of things that have to do with, with the God. Um, okay. The Gemara, however, seems to contradict the passage in a different Gemara, which says, Kedoshim, who is Benan Shal Kedoshim, the son of the Holy Ones? It was Rabbi Menachem, the son of Rabbi Simlai. Why was he called the son of the Holy Ones? Because he refused to even look at images on coins. He, he was very, he was considered what they call, that's why he considered someone who's, who's holy, is that he would not look even at a graven image on a coin. That was not, clearly not a, um, an idol. So here we have Rabbi Menachem, of Sim, the, Rav, the, Rabbi Chana, Menachem, the son of Rabbi Simai, who was praised with the nickname of the Holy One, because he never looked at any images. This indicates that his behavior went above and beyond normal level that is required by Allah. This implies it would normally be permitted to look at images on coins. Um, however, this seems to contradict the earlier Gemara, which explicitly states that viewing a statue of, or any creative work is forbidden. How do, we res okay, so how do we resolve the contradiction between the two Gemaras? Here we have our Tosas in Avodazar. Specifically referring to that which we're talking about, the statue, which is prohibited to look at during the week. Um, that is specifically statues which are created to function as idols. However, statues and figures created simply for their beauty and visual appeal are permitted. So one can see this from the fact that the Gemara elsewhere in the Bodhisattva describes a, person, a certain pious man, Ramanagam Rabbi Simai, who is known as Benan Tukatoshim because he never looked at images, from the fact that Rabbi Nachum is described as demonstrating exceptional piety, um, it would em emerge that normal standard was that other people would have no problem viewing such, such images. So therefore, let's bring it back to what's going on inside the Sistine Chapel or inside the Vatican altogether. Would you, we all agree that we have numerous saints that are going on over there, hanging around over there? Many saints. Um, ooh, yeah, Adrian. Um, I'm having trouble distinguishing between things that are created for a specific reason and your attitude towards those things. If you are viewing them as works of art and not idols, 
I, I'm having trouble understanding why they would be forbidden for whatever reason they're created. Isn't it your attitude that's important? If, um, if, if, uh, I mean, big artists nowadays. If, if, if Claude Monet mm -hmm. were, were to, were to, were to spend, were to have spent a year creating Jesus on a cross, yeah, would, would, could, could we come and say, well, I'm looking at the beauty of the Monet? Or could we, could we agree that what's going on over here is there's a sense of idolatry or idol worship going on over here, and therefore we're not even going to look at it from that perspective. Does that make sense? So therefore, I may be wanting to look for beauty, but if it was specifically created from that perspective, from the perspective of idol worship, then it becomes a prohibition. Well, then, but then, don't the shape of the whole sesquite chapel and everything that was all created for, for that for that purpose. But don't perspectives change throughout the ages? Things that maybe originally were created for reason are no longer viewed that way down in a different century. Um, I mean, let, give me an example where you think something would have changed. Something was created by the worship and now it would change. Mm -hmm. Restate that because that's what's inconsistent for me. You're looking at a work of art. Does this mean that before you can comfortably be in the presence of that work of art, you have to have some indication of what the motive was uh, on the part of the artist? You see, I, I want to go, I want to take, let, let's go slow, right? Let's take things to the extreme and, and then clarify. So let's take, would we agree that Jesus, Jay-Z on a cross would, would fall under a category that we, we'd say there's a prayer for it? according to all perspectives. Would we agree? We'd all agree on that. Okay. Then I want to take a statue of a, of a saint, St. Mary, St. Peter, well, I don't know, the Hogeshap, all, right? Would we agree that those statues, what do they represent? Saints, are they about, about What's a saint mean? They call them saints. They call them the same. Why do they call them the same? Because they're so they're his, his, his disciples, the their followers. They're yeah, but they don't just call them saints. Well, or not. They do. Why do they call they them think, saints? Well, they think they got special powers. They got special powers, right? They turn them into right. what does that mean? <clears throat> they really, turn them into a saint, a saint meaning yeah. something that is well, yeah, people immoral. pray to them. You're right. People, people pray, pray to them. them. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's true. And go visit any Mexican house. Yeah. Right. So they clearly are, are, so we have these, the, they'll have these saints. And uh, I mean, a saint would come as close to you as you can get to an idol. Would you agree, Adrian? Okay. And then, and then, well, we'll go, we'll take that to the, to the next level would be, let's say, uh, the, is it called the creation? Oh yeah, the system creation, right? Creation, right? Um, what do we call that? Is that called? Um, I don't think I, I would see that more from a perspective of art. It's my personal perspective, right? The real question is: if something is created to beautify an idol, what what does that do to it? What define? What what makes it? What is it? What happens to it? Right? It's in order to give glory to the idol. I'm not saying, I'm, I haven't moved through this yet, but I'm, I'm just saying like, it, it was created as a view, no one denies, everyone agrees that it's of the most beautiful pieces in the world, right? The question is, what's the, what was the goal? It was created to, to beautify a church, a chapel, right? So we'd love to go in and be inspired by the art and, and taken up with art. But the question is like, where does that put us with regards to, um, with this regard? 
What about the this take the statue of the David? What is wrong with David? Right. I don't think that it's a problem. It, yeah, it should be a problem, right? Where is it, by the way? It's, it's, in, a, it's, in, a, it's in a museum, it's right? A, yeah. That would be interesting. I don't think, it, it, I don't it, think it, the statue of David is a problem. How about the statue of Moses? There's a page of the statue of Moses. Of Moses. There's a, there's a, I but, know. but do you know what? The statue of Moses is actually in a church. Okay. So it's that would be. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Trying to beautify the church then. Trying to beautify the church? We ask good questions. Okay, so <clears throat> interestingly, the Tosas and Masechus of Odazara, where the story of Menachem originally appears, presents a different approach to explain why Rabbi Menachem's behavior was exceptional beyond the norm, right? Rabbi Menachem was the guy that wouldn't look at coins. Tosas asks, why is it such a big deal that Benan Knot Shel Kadoshim would not view any images? The Gemara in Shabbos already clearly states the viewing statutes is statues is forbidden. So why isn't it obvious that Rabbi Nachman would avoid looking at them? Tosas answer that perhaps viewing the image on a coin, which one is accustomed to seeing regularly, is not going to cause a person to turn his heart away from God. Nevertheless, Rabbi Menachem was stringent upon himself and would not view any such images on a coin. So what's he saying? He's saying that. Perhaps the issue of looking at an image becomes a halachic challenge, becomes prohibited when it's going to affect you. When it's going to affect you and the way you, you your perspective uh, with regards to Id idolatry. That's where it's prohibited. No, that's where it's not even prohibited. It's not, it's not prohibited, but that's where he was holy. He was considered holy. So it's not necessarily a prohibition, was considered holy for not looking at it. Tosis here draws a distinction between images in which one re is regularly exposed and other images. In contrast to the previous Tosis, which said that decorative images are permitted since they are not designed to be worshipped, the Tosis over here indicates that even decorative images are forbidden. I didn't see that in Tosis. Oh, I see. That was his original question. Rabbi Nachman was lauded for following the additional stringency of avoiding the sight of images on coins. Now the picture to which people are regularly exposed, Tosis explains that viewing such images is not strictly forbidden because there is no risk of straying after them due to one's frequent exposure to them. And thus, they do not fall under the Torah's provision and do not turn to items. Thus, there are two views concerning which types of artwork a Jew is prohibited from viewing. Tosis and Shabbos rules that is only forbidden to view images that are themselves objects of worship. Images made for decorative purposes, purposes are permitted. Decorative purposes for an idol, right? Tosis and Avodos are ever maintains that it's forbidden to view any image except for those to which people are regularly exposed, such as the pictures printed on currency. Meaning pictures that would normally have been viewed in 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 uh, in in regular regular viewing, so it's not going to give you this awe experience. Okay, so since Tosis has two opposing views, how do we pass him? What has the halacha? So the Tulchan Aruch Avi here he says it is forbidden to listen to instruments of idol worship, or Hate these things when they come up, right? I think like church choirs are phenomenal. It is forbidden to listen to instruments of idol worship or to view noi avodes kachamim since one derives enjoyment from the site. The stackel benoi avodes kachamim. Noi is the decorations of idol worship because one takes enjoyment from the site and it's prohibited to take enjoyment. What exactly are noi avodes kacham? The shach explains that noi avodes kacham means the beauty of idols that have been worshipped. That's what the shach says. The beauty of idols that have not been that have been worshipped. Noi is usually the decoration. Noi a sukkah is decorations that we put in a sukkah. So here he says noi avodes kacham is usually a decoration of the idol worship. The shach seems to take difference to that and says not the decoration of the idol, but says the beauty 
of the idol. So one's looking at the idol, not from a perspective of worshiping, but wanting to take in that art artistic perspective. Which view of Tosa is the Shah seems the Shah seems to follow the Tosa's more lenient ruling, which permits the viewing statue, the viewing statues and artworks, so long as the statues or artwork themselves are not being worshipped. That's what the Shah seems to say. It was, by the way, it was a, a Ashkenazi uh, authority. By contrast, the Magen Abraham cites both views of Tosas, implying that it is laudable to be stringent, although he notes that the minig, the custom, is to follow the lenient view. The Magen Abraham also clarifies that even those who forbid viewing statues and artwork meant to be worshipped would permit seeing them in passing, but need not close his eyes to prevent them from coming into his line of sight. Only staring and gazing at such images would be considered problematic according to his more stringent view. Thus, in light of the comments of the Shach and the Magen Abraham, it would seem that it is certainly permissible to view decorative art as long as the artwork is not an object of worship. As such, if entering the areas of the Vatican outside the church would be permissible, it would also be permissible to view the artwork that is present over there. Yeah, that, that kind of was my question. If, if we're not using it for that purpose, can you, can you define the purpose? Can you make a pass at trying to figure out what worship actually means? Something that is worshiped, are you saying? Yeah, what does it mean? I, uh, what do you mean? Um, praying to them? Using, using them for some sort of spiritual entity to some sort of spiritual goal, something to that, is, to that extent? Does that make sense? No, I, yes, I'm I, working on it. Yeah, I got it. I, I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's coming to me from what he said, what he was, seemed to be saying with regards to the, the real question. So what does that mean? Does, if, can, can one look at a cross now? Can one look at a saint? It would, seem, it would seem that it's certainly permissible to view decorative artwork, so long as the artwork is not an object of, of worship. Fine. As such, if entering the areas of Vatican outside the church, it would be permissible, it would be permissible to view the artwork present there. However, we must also take into account an important distinction. Okay, fine. So he clearly says, so what's, what's really important is if you've been to the Vatican, okay. and I hope you enjoyed it. Don't go to the chapel ever again. That's what he's <laughs> clearly trying to say. No, but so, if you're not standing in front of it and praying, I think. No, he says you can't go, one's, one's prohibited to go into the church. Okay. Then we started off right in the beginning. Prohibited to go into the chapel. Yeah, so, I'm, and I'm in front of a decorative art, artwork. But I'm not praying to it for any That's fine. The artwork, the artwork, the artwork that is outside of the chapel seems mm -hmm. to be okay, okay according to these opinions. So in the halls or whatever, but the, the actual chapel where it's just like the Sistine Chapel, you don't go. That's what Ecclesi seems to say. Okay. I actually am uncomfortable viewing no. the stuff in a in a church or a chapel. Must be Jewish. I, what is he saying? Because you're Jewish. Uh, it must be because I'm Jewish. Yes. I remember I was uh, I was 18 years old when they my best friend got married and it was my first dream trip to America. Got to see America, and I went with my cousin. We went to uh, Manhattan and we took the the hop on hop off bus. We bought a ticket, all day bus, hop on, hop off, and they took us. And one of the highlights was the church somewhere. I don't remember where it was. And they were like, you have to see it. It's most amazing. I remember at the stop, everyone got off. And like, I was sitting there, and my, my, I was sitting there with my cousin. And she, I remember the tour guide was like, you guys should get, you have to go in and see it. And I remember I walked into, there was like that inner area, the outside like before the chapel and I looked up and I was like, what the 
kill them. I do. It, just, <laughs> it made me so uncomfortable. Um, whatever, I was a good Jewish boy. Okay, um, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, 1986. That, we, that which Tosis writes permitting viewing images made for decoration. Um, so he's really giving us a small summary of the whole uh, response of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Because he clearly says, what's prohibited to enter into the church. Um, um, and he specifically, his intro is, it's prohibited to walk into a church um, to work into a church of Catholics, of the, of, of, of the Christians, is a place where they serve idols and they do, they make their prayers over there. And that is prohibited to enter, even to just to look at the, the images of the great, the statues, Shayyidin uh, Shirak Noi that are known that they're just for beauty. They were made just for beauty. Um, that which shows us rights permitting views, ima viewing images made for decoration. This refers only to general decoration, such as monuments that are on a king's images printed on currency and pictures in homes. But if the artwork, was made to adorn an idol or a house of worship, then it is forbidden to derive benefit from it, just as it is forbidden to benefit from an idol itself. All the images that are situated there in the church, near the church, even those that are not worshiped, are made for the purpose of beautifying their deity and the house of worship, which renders the images forbidden to benefit from. Furthermore, aside from the prohibition, to view the artwork, it is destructive to one's faith and mind to want to go there. And my son, Rav David, noted that the entire purpose of these decorations is to lure and attract people to approach the house of worship and is certainly forbidden to fulfill their wish and approach them and thus, heaven forbid, that someone should go there. That was Ramosha Feinstein's perspective on the beauty of the church. I mean, he's got a very strong argument. Why did they make it so beautiful? <clears throat> Why, why do they, I don't know, pay whoever it is, steal or whatever it was? Why do they stick them out there? The people are coming? It's not like the Pope has such a sensitive uh, right. perspective in art, right? It's, it's, he's, he's, he's saying very clearly, it's to lure people to come in. If you're fulfilling their wish, why are they trying to lure people to come in? Going back to our original discussion with uh, other situation, what other situation can we think of where a Jew might need to enter a church for a reason not related to worship? Question. No, I muted. To Less find, said to find a men's room. Uh, I said for a wedding. <laughs> to find wedding, a men's room. wedding or a funeral. A wedding or a funeral. Of or, somebody not Jewish. By the way, um, was Bill Clinton, Obama, Obama's inauguration was in a church. A part of the inauguration was in a church. I believe we have a, we have a, we have a talk on that. Um, and one of the rallies was invited. He resigned. He, he refused. Uh, he didn't take it up. Um, let me just look it up. And... Um, Can a rabbi enter a church? What happened to it? Is refuge from a storm yet? Yeah. After Barack Obama's election as the 44th president of the United States in fall 2008, Preparations were made were under the way for the inaugural festivities to be held in January 2009. So this was um, an invitation was sent to a prominent Orthodox rabbi asking him to participate in the inaugural service, which was to be held at the National Sanctuary in an Episcopalian church. The rabbi felt compelled to decline the invitation, noting the halachic prohibition that forbids Jews from entering a church. According to reports, 
The president-elect and his staff were both startled and offended by the refusal, but ultimately found another Orthodox rabbi who agreed to participate. Second rabbi attended the ceremony and even recited verses from Tanakh, from the Torah as part of the service. His participation drew criticism from certain segments of the Orthodox Jewry, um, including the Rabbinical Council of America, of which he is a member in response. The rabbi penned a letter explaining the halachic justification for his attendance to the service. This pact was, okay, and that's, that was our next subject. But um, there you have it. The, um, Entering. So uh, the most common challenge that from Jews have with regards to entering the area of a church is to attend AA meetings, 12-step meetings. In order to, um, yeah. there, are, there are thousands and thousands, or there, there are hundreds of Orthodox, recover, Orthodox Jews in recovery, and they attend 12-step they attend meetings, and the 12-step meetings will uh, often, most often, are either church held direct. in a church I because know. they have the space. Okay. I would love to turn. So why don't we do something at the I'm dying to get something off the ground in the Okay, we'll talk later. Okay, ready, okay. ready to get it going. We have space. We have everything ready to get it. Um, uh, according to many opinions, as long as there is not a service going on at the time of the program as at the time of the meeting it is fine to go into and as long as one doesn't go into the actual chat yeah oh voting stations question arises con uh, arises concerning voting stations that are set up in churches as is common in many locals throughout the united states is it permissible for a jew to enter a church for the purpose of voting based on a discussion earlier it would seem that according to the vast majority of post game one should not enter the church sanctuary itself even just to cast the ballot. The question remains, however, whether one may vote in a church if the voting booth is stationed outside the sanctuary in another room inside the building. The motion finally addressed the similar question to whether or not children may be allowed to play in a room of a church. The motion cites that playing there is unequivocally forbidden. It is certainly unequivocal, it is certainly forbidden, even if there are no images because of the Gemara, which says, distance yourself from it. This refers to distancing yourself from heresy. There are many tr people trying to lure and incite Jews away from the faith, especially there in the churches. To the contrary, children should be taught to keep a distance from there and that the church is a repugnant and despicable place. Even if this room is needed for a Torah school, this cannot be allowed. And even for a higher price, they should find a different location for the school. But Moshe thus equates rooms in a church with the church sanctuary itself. Okay. I don't want to go, I, I, I beg to differ with regards to how much he's taking a crisis, saying Moshe equates rooms in a church with the church sanctuary itself with respect to this requirement of distancing oneself from heresy. That's what it would seem there is no room to allow voting in a church according to Moshe Feinstein. I disagree. I don't think that that's what, it's, that's what Moshe Feinstein is saying. I think what Moshe Feinstein is actually saying is that to run a Jewish program in a side room of a church mm -hmm. is a problem. I think that's where his issue is. To, for the for the side room of a church to be a common place or a place where you're going to be practicing uh, having running a program if you have any images i think that's where the problem is according to Moshe finds it but to actually go into a church in order to cast the ballot i don't think that that is um i i, I don't think that one could draw that from out of rabbi Moshe feinstein's um uh, in school yeah is there's a church and there's a school building. Right. Her school. Now it's not a. It's not a. a, it's, Jew, not a it's not right. a Jewish school. It's not a Catholic school. It's, yeah. it's a private school. Yeah. And it's not near the church, but it's part of the church because it's it's the school building of it. Right. So, if the there are there are Jewish kids that go to that school. I mean, is that that maybe they shouldn't go? Is that a bad place? I mean, is that something? What is he saying? So. I mean, if, they're learning, if they're I'm not mistaken, half of, I don't know, half, half of Manhattan, the major part of Manhattan is owned by the church. Ma massive amounts of, of real estate is owned by the church. So we're going to say anything that's owned by a church is, is not allowed. I think if you've got a church and then you've also got on the property, there's 
there's a school is clearly a school, yeah. right? Right. What we're talking about over here is you got your church building, and then the church has rooms that are allocated for things that are active in the church, and therefore, um, you know, using those rooms would be a problem if one were running a Jewish program over there. Uh, my understanding, once again, coming back to, I mean, he seemed to be challenged with kids' program, right? Children should be taught to keep a distance from it. What about, a, you know, someone who's in a 12-step program, would I tell a person who's in a 12-step program to avoid, avoid meetings in a church? I would not. I would tell them, you go to any meeting that you can get. Um, however, there are more recent authorities, such as Moshe Stemmel, who's still alive, who rule that voting in the side room of a church can be permitted at times. Rabbi Stemmel requires that one enter the church through a side entrance. In such cases, and not through the regular entrance used by those who are coming to prayer services. Other authorities are even more lenient since one entering a church to vote on election day has manifestly different intent than one entering for prayer. Uh, whether entering a church to vote is permissible or not, hala or not, a lot of authorities agree that such an arrangement is far from ideal. Many efforts should be put uh, forth to either vote by absentee ballot or petition the local authority to switch a voting venue um, are certainly praiseworthy. In conclusion, while some authorities permit entering a church or the Vatican, it's clear that one is not entering it or when if it is clear that one is doing so, not in order to worship. The vast majority of authorities say it is forbidden to enter the actual area. S areas surrounding the church or the Vatican would seem permissible, uh, permissible if one's intent is manifestly innocuous. Um, viewing decorative art, images or statues that are not created to be worshiped is generally permitted. If artwork or statues are made explicitly for the purpose of beautifying a church, the Moshe Feinstein maintains that viewing these should be forbidden. I want to just pull out that my understanding was that in the Vatican, um, the saints are, are plotted all, are dropped all over the place, uh, outside of the chapels. And I wonder what that, what, what that makes those areas outside of the chapel? Does that make it a place of worship? How much of that area is, is considered a place of worship? Do we, do we talk about that, what the, what the Gemara originally says, that one needs to stay four hours away for avoid the uh, immediate area by four hours? Questions to be thought. Voting in the church sanctuary is forbidden, although voting in the side room or basement is permitted if there is no alternative. Hmm. Okay, gentlemen, I, I do think that he was a bit on the more um, more stringent. stringent side, a little bit, hmm. it sounded a bit more stringent from, from my education. But, uh, you know, it's always good and important to see the sources yeah. and to see where, where things are rooted in uh, rather than just go blindly. Uh, so for those of you who've not been to the Vatican. Don't go. Me. Take, take pictures. <laughs> go to the Louvre. Where other massive collections of art are there? I'm sure there's everywhere, right? Yeah, there's the Museum. There's so many places. There are enough museums outside yes. outside of the Vatican to go and see good. Go to the Artists of Chicago. They have great stuff. Which one? Artists of Chicago. Really? Oh, it's amazing. You should sure go. Yeah. Rabbi, I'm thinking that to stay safe, when you go to a museum of any any kind, you ought to wear a bowling shirt, which establishes your priority on things. <laughs> I'm clearly not here to pray. Yeah. Thank um, you. Okay, thank you for joining. We thank you. Tomorrow. Okay. Have a great Shabbos. We'll see you guys on Shabbos, hopefully. Yes. Bye, guys. Looking forward. Looking forward. Shabbat shalom.